Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to TNO, the Lasses of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Mokalover, as we are struggling with trying to dismantle the CCP, or the Committee of Chinese Labor. Um, so it's giving us um, a run for our money. We'll put it like that. But, taking it to the streets. The boulevard bustled with protesters as they jostled back and forwards. Uh, occasionally, they tossed some bricks or other missiles from the crowd. Hmm, go figure. As the far end of the boulevard, a police barricade is set up. The crowd bounced against the riot police's wall of shields, and occasionally a truncheon bounced against their heads. Seems like this has been common in Guangdong for some time now, but the recent decision to escalate the police response had taken a significant turn. As we have a protester surge forward, a cry rang out from within the ranks of the police. The first line of riot police broke rank and ran forward, beating the agitators and forcing them back. The protesters began to flee down the boulevard and into the side streets. Some stood the ground and were beaten and arrested, while others couldn't make it away in time and were likely pounced on. All these unlucky individuals were promptly loaded into waiting vans and driven away. These captives would soon find themselves driven out of the main uh, cities and herded into the makeshift detention centers. Hastily assembled, these institutions were cobbled together from mobile offices and quickly erected uh, wire fences. While not serving any time in official capacity, the detention centers had proven to be a quick temporary remedy for the problem of the CCL. They were not, however, doing anything to ease the tensions with the Chinese workers, and the Guangdong police force were well aware of this. Back at the Guangdong police force, the senior commissioner was left with a choice. The escalation of the protest crackdown was his idea. It was a keenly aware of the escalating mission or situation. There needed to be some movement in terms of actually cracking down on the CCL. Two options were presented to them. They could either begin interrogations immediately or observe the prisoners until they form a hierarchy and pick out the leaders from this. Both were risky, but the first had the benefit of potentially producing quicker and theoretically less reliable results. Time was of the essence, though, so the option was attractive. The second option was perhaps likely to allow them to more quickly identify the leadership, though some doubt of the CCL is that straightforwardly hierarchical. Drag him in for question immediately, so we're back in time a little bit. We're still doing the unlimited detention. We've heard about deployed armor and advised against movement as well, so if you want about those, please go ahead, like we did, and everything for Guangdong. Morita Kao and Li Kishin have staked everything on making Guangdong a place where they have a chance of succeeding. Hand in hand with those who envision Guangdong, that is more than just a factory floor for the Japanese Zaibatsu and the tycoons. To give up now will be a betrayal not only of our mission, but of tens of thousands who look to us to provide a model for a better future under Sony and Chong Kong. Even as, three pros and the outlying provinces are consumed in days of rage and plumes of tear gas as the rubble of discontent uh, in Tokyo grow louder, we have no choice but to walk to our path to its bitter end. Um, a beating iron bush, court in session. Uh, first to arrive were the Guangdong delegation headed by Murray Takeo, while his aides took the opportunity to check that all the necessary papers were present. The chief executive took a moment to glance into a mirror stretching along one side of the wall that could, uh, a conference room. He fixed his tie, smoothed down his jacket, and tried to work the stiffness out of his shoulders. Oh, oh I, this. I think I read this before. The door at the end of the conference room uh, opened, and the Chinese followed in with the consul General Song and Tashe Wang at the hang of the pack. The two chatted to each other and so confidently, trying their best to convey a total lack of concern over the proceedings. The chief executive caught their eye, the two shot foul glares at his way. Finally, the ja two Japanese entered, and everyone hurried to their seats. Consul General Takashima was keeping a neutral expression, and as a buffet of senior diplomat, General Gano, however, seemed not to be interested in such niceties, so scowling at anyone unfortunate enough to be in his line of sight. As many began, Morita KL concerns the grave matter of Chinese interference in internal affairs. As you've been informed, we've gathered significant evidence regarding this, with particular note to the involvement of Tashi Wang. A ridiculous song fired back, we demand an explanation for this impertinence to China. At this point, Takashima held up his hand, and the room fell silent. Myself and General Gano, well, Act as mediators, he said. Gentlemen, please try to be civil. On such unprofessionals, I will not recommend us to your side. The game begins, which we basically went through last time. We didn't read that one specifically, but basically nothing happens. Being an iron bush, though, the hope beyond the order to immediately interrogate the recently processed prisoners was that most of the so-called activists of the CCL were merely a band of disorganized rabble rousing and dissidents. Dissident. After a few hours of strict questioning, they would probably be broken down and spilled in their secrets before the shift's end. Our reality delights are crushing the expectations of hope. The indiscriminate approach to interrogating the prisoners has proven fruitless. No matter whom the officers shout down or attempt to persuade with physical beatdowns, none so far have yet to be part with their knowledge easily, if at all. It appears the CCL has been radicalized to such an extent that their organizational structure appears quite disciplined, forcing the commissioner to suspend any further interrogations and observe them among the detained, the ones that appear to be calling the shots. Targeting the ringleaders would prove to be the next course of best course of action. That being said, the precious time wasted in questioning these activists has led to quite the wave of irritation being expressed by both Guangdong and Yi's administration and our superiors from Tokyo. It would be prudent not to add further to others' fire. Time to play. Find the leader. Nice. You know, doing all that stuff would be very good for us, too. But Japanese... Oh, the pressure to take action. Well, it's not good. Well, we can speak to the Japanese consul. We can do that one. Even though I do want to do this one some more. But, you know, it's alright. Product cycle in uh, less than three months. We have a little bit more time still. We'll see. Case crashes. Oh. 
Oh, what do you know about this? Uh, at the full moment, Murutakeo began speaking that things went wrong. It became quickly apparent that the chief executive had nothing that he could be even generously described as concrete evidence. Though he tried to paper over the holes in his argument, the rhetorical flourish was invective. The smiling Chinese and grimacing um, <clears throat> uh, Japanese clearly weren't buying it. Once the chief executive had finished and sat down, sweat trickling down his back, Song make a quick rebuttal. There wasn't much to be said. Guangdong had offered nothing to support their extraordinary claims, and it only damaged the relationship with China. Tashi Wang added that while they hadn't expected much, this was still a rather pathetic attempt. Takashima and Nagano looked at each other for a moment and asked for a quick break. Hey, it won't be so bad. This was a mistake. So we're going to, I've been like auto saving and whatnot and going back in time and whatnot. So we're going to do what I think is the best route for us to get at least a clue first to help dismantle the CCL, singling out the big fish. While the waiting game is far from the, being the ideal situation or solution to a crisis such as this, a tenant organization, the CCL proves that there is a command hierarchy pulling all the strings. Such a hierarchy doubtlessly showed itself among the prisoners, so the creative use of a spacious room to serve as a holding cell, one-way window for observing police officers and a coffee machine to maintain astute vigilance, the authorities stand by and watch for the first sign of leadership among the detained. With some time, the patients will be rewarded. Eventually, the prisoners begin to crack and seek out their authority figures for guidance, one among them seems to stand out the most. Liu Xing, an ex-captain of the KMT, veteran of a number of battles against the Imperial Army, and also manager of the Yellow Dragon Association, which lends aid to migrating Chinese. With the ringleader singled out, all left in this nest now is to send the rabble back to their cells and begin the interrogations thoroughly, first with Captain Singh, and then let us proceed. Our first step. Um, yeah, I heard this one last time. If you remember this one, please go ahead for about first step. My goal is just to read through the ones that uh, give us uh, these things. The silk glove and the steel baton. Well, those darnable riots have gone on for too long, where to K.O. knew. He was more than aware of the fact, as he was aware of the deteriorating situation on the streets. As he was aware of the crashing line of the stock exchange, we'd gone every single company who had worth anything in the city to call him in a panic. Idiots, idiots, idiots. He attracted them regularly. Sometimes many had always known were fools. Sometimes many thought he could have faith them. Those around him were cracking under it all. Maybe he too was in some way, but at least he had the sense to recognize that his government alone could actually solve this disaster in a way that could even kill the heart of Guangdong itself. It was a sense which, as he knew now, wasn't shared with many. Now there are these rumors, these stupid, stupid rumors of men squealing to Tokyo, Tokyo, telling them of all these wild stories of disorder and chaos. Of the Pearl River Delta on flames, of a KMT or CPC, or who knows what revolution ready to explode. As if the situation wasn't in hand, as if Morita Kiao didn't know what he was doing. He rested a moment, a vision flashing upon his eyelids as if projected onto a screen. Thousands of soldiers in tan disembarking from ships, planes, trains, and trucks, armed with rifles and bearing the rising sun. Gunfire on the streets, screaming protesters fleeing bullets which cut them down, a city in flames, then two, then three. Socks collapsing, skyscrapers as empty husks, dead cities propped up by an army which infested it, an eternal zombie consigned to nothingness, shambling towards a hopeless future. His eyes opened again. No, he wouldn't have that. The space was too vibrant, too volatile, too profitable to kill, and he had too much plan to let it die. He could fix this if he just had some time. All he needed now was time. Hello, operator. Give me the Japanese consulate, please. Featured sick. Interrogation of Captain Liu had proven to be ineffective. Offers of immunity were staunch or rebuffed, and any attempt of physical coercion was met with great resistance by the prisoner, who was stated that he had suffered much greater agonies at the hands of the Japanese Hunden. Interrogators have also reported that the prisoner has stated his intention revealed not one piece of information, claiming he would rather join his brothers in the dirt than to betray the future Guangdong and rising China. The link between his activities and the mention of the Republic of China could only mean that he may have been trained by their intelligence services, and thus more stronger methods would be required. The report suggests that perhaps a camp like services would be ideal in breaking down the prisoner's resistance to questioning. Given the chaotic situation on the ground, it is certain that they will implement excruciating methods of torture to acquire the information as quickly as possible. Regardless of the prisoner's life is at risk, however, there is an alternative. Through our access to the civilian registry, we can track, track down any individual who is remotely related to the prisoner, be his children, family, spouse, or even his entire association. Certainly, one of them would be wanting to be spared from the consequences of his crime. The commissioner awaited instruction on how he should proceed. Let them show the camp out show his true agony, find his weak link, and bring him in. And, courtesy call, chief executive. Marito Keo knew the voice of the consul Jun Takashima well by now, the slight rasp, the tired tone, the bureaucratic evenness. Meetings upon meetings have burned its sound into his ears like a brand now. Nowadays, it was just a bit more exhausted, a little coarse, a little less composed than it was the last time. Surely between him and Takashima, there was enough stress to give an elephant a heart attack. Yes, hello, consul general. I'm sure you've heard these rumors of revolution in the cities, and I'd like to clear the air with you. They're false, entirely false. Yes, chief executive, I'm aware. Marito Keo could practically smell the cigarette smoke through the sound of exaltation, exhaustion alone. It is a difficult situation to be sure. I trust your men are holding up. Of course, of course. There's towering work to keep order at a town like this, but they have served honorably. We're doing all we can to get them the rest they deserve. Mm -hmm. The son of a pen and paper was uh, next across the line. Now, Chief Executive, I won't lie to you. My superiors are anxious about all of this. 
On Rasmex, investors worried, and when investors worried, they stopped spending their money. I have conveyed it to them that the IJ intervention wouldn't help with, at all with that. Good, good. Now was the chief executive taking notes on his own. And the response? They believe me for now. The very words sent a shiver of relief down Marita uh, Kale's spine. Uh, provided that this riding peters out soon, and it will, yes. Now he looked out of his office window again. Plume of smoke rose over the city before him. The city. His reputation. His word. He'd have to save them all. Of course. Of course. Sins of the father and husband. We've investigated the captain's background and discovered that the man has a wife and son, both suspected of showing sympathetic sentiments to the CCL cause. If not directly involved with the ongoing riots, once their domicile is located, we quickly dispatch officers to apprehend the two and bring them into an adjacent room to the interrogation chamber to demonstrate to the prisoner that a threat is far from a mere bluff, as expected. The shock upon the captain's visage means that we now have leverage. Our leverage. Interrogators. I have assured the prisoner that the family would not be questioned by our man, but they would be given to the camp by tie if he further attempted to withhold the truth. It would not take long for the captain to finally relent, and we are currently jotting down all important information gathered from his breakthrough. As for the son and wife, they will remain in custody until the crisis is resolved, but we have made a comp compromise, and that they may share the same cells per the captain's request. Even the strongest men have their weaknesses. And if you're on this one, please go ahead. And... A routine disrupted. Uh... I think I've read this. I've read this before, so let's just, we're losing more seats again. Oh, well, Crestus forces all of us to economize again. If you want to do this one, please go ahead. Boop. And one step ahead. In the conference room of the Guangdong Police Force Academy, the brass concerned with the rest, recent riots have gathered to report on the findings of the interrogations. Spirits were generally high. The uncharacteristically nervous disposition of the senior commissioner vanished, and his stern and confident demeanor to return. The superintendent general was also feeling happier, though he didn't show us outwardly there was work to be done. A superintendent in charge of one of the detention centers was given a summary of his findings. The evidence was overwhelming. I'm afraid it's very clear to us what's being planned, the superintendent said. There's a major disruption along some of the most important transport hubs in Guangdong, both the three pros and the regional cities. This would be a huge economic blow to the Cope Prosperity Sphere if it were to succeed. The senior commissioner nodded. At least we're ahead of them for once, just in time, it seems. I don't want to speak out of turn, but a disruption on the scale could affect the economy of Guangdong itself, and the mainland became concerned. The superintendent general shot him an accusing glance, but said nothing. The senior commissioner continued. Assuming the best conditions, we essentially have two ways of acting. We can either set up an extra security details outside of major ports and airports, or we can focus again on the interrogations. The major concern with our first plan of action is that we run the risk of tipping the CCL off, but it could be a good way to prevent a disruption of the scale. Return of the interrogations will give us more time and more information to act on. The men milled over their opinions or options for a while, and their natural conclusion eventually revealed itself. Increased security in major transport hubs, even at the risk of tipping them off. You'll need more information before we can proceed. Keep it covert, return to interrogations. Increase security. You want increased security in the Ersatz Panapoli of War. Uh, here they come again. What on earth are they wearing? One of the policemen's officers echoed across the street as the ragged police line steadied itself for the oncoming uh, tide. Rocks thrown by agitators had knocked a few holes in the line as cops staggered away with bleeding heads and fresh concussions. Now the push seemed to be happening in earnest. Many of the protesters were equipped with padding and crude helmets. Some even carried bamboo sticks. Uh, and now appearing like a ragtag mirror of their police opposition around every neck, a wet, hung t uh, wet towel hung, ready to be brought up to protect against the whole... Now, ubiquitous tear gas could wreak havoc on the early marches. A new sense of discipline had come over the group. They marched in unison, holding formation that challenged the police's buckling ranks. Further down the road, beyond the oncoming column of protesters, tires had been set alight and left in the middle of the road. Flames looked greedily over the rubber, sending stinking black smoke into the air. Similar columns of inky smoke rose from the other streets, filling the air with an accurate stench that combined with the shouts, screams, and sirens to produce a truly oppressive atmosphere. While none of the three pros rolled, rolled in the violence, tearing themselves apart, citizens, workers, and desperates. Clashed in the streets with rank after rank of policemen, all around the cities. The cacophony of the protests roared, drowning out all else. The pressure mounts and the screams rise higher. His concerns are going up. Tipping her hand. Commissioner Mori read through the latest batch of reports from the various precincts in Guangdong. It had been a few days since he had signed off on increased security around, around, around uh, major transport hubs, and it was hoping the results would vindicate his actions. On the one hand, um, officers stationed in the planned target locations made several arrests of individuals that, after rigorous interrogations, have been revealed to have uh, scouts casing the transport hubs in advance of the t actual attacks. Even now, the precincts housing these scouts were still ringing valuable intel from the would-be terrorists. However, Amori had a still had a gnawing regret. The attacks had almost certainly been deterred without accruing any damages or unnecessary risk, but also this had cost his officers most of the leads they'd gathered so far in the CCO's plans. They didn't like that from this point forward. Guangdong's police would be venturing into the unknown territory. At least the transport hubs are safe. Receive one of the clues required needed before we can strike the CCO. So we control the underworld, which we do. We only need two clues. And it's, or we needed three. We need to revise our options to gather clues on the CCL. Oh boy. Well, let's see what the next one is for us. That happens, but it's fine for now. And test meeting. So you know about that, and we're going to go with investigating some associated organizations. With GFT operating in the open, the CCO remains hidden in the shadows, maintaining a facade as a community group assisting downtrodden workers and the unemployed while it foments dissidents through the ongoing riots. 
While we have barely any knowledge of the CCO's leadership other than it exists, the coordinated nature of these attacks signify hierarchy within the community's ranks. Connecting these on top out to the lower numbers, or lower members doing the dirty work, it'll be through them that we can begin a hunt for clues. By the order of the commissioner, the Guangdong Police Forces begin investigating any known sympathizers to the committee, as well as any overlooked associations that have cooperated with the CCO. Our officers will prior to the detention of anyone with close ties to the organization, which should allow us to gather a great amount of intelligence without wasting much of our resources. However, given the priority order to investigate the links, we will not have sufficient units to prevent the rise from worsening. Now, however, we need to choose what leads to pursue the nexuses of community organizations within Guangdong or the ties that lead to the Republic of China. Local communities are next. I was revising against movement and curfew units is next. Increase the admin costs. At this point, whatever. Ob observing the overlooked. We're happy to report that we have successfully compiled a list of every known community association and group currently operating in the city of Guangdong. Gathering the information has proven to be quite easy, as many of these associations were found on either ethnic, rural, family, clan, or home city ties, its members, maintaining contact even as they were displaced across the three proles. Due to the lack of political emphasis in the groups, they were mostly overlooked by our anti insurgency operations throughout this decade. We'll rectify that. So right now, the GPF will proceed with undertaking infiltration missions to gather intelligence from within these groups, which will report our findings once we make a breakthrough, and we shall proceed with curfew. Even though I would really like to start lowering more of the Japanese concerns. Uh, let's see. Uh, by order of the Chief Executive, and with the consent of the Cabinet and Legislative Council, the radios, TVs, and public announcement systems blared the curfews have now been decreed from 1700 hours onwards until sunrise. Departing your residence and engaging in any movement without an express directive or writ of permission from the Guangdong police or government will be punishable by fines and imprisonment without trial. Furthermore, during the day, all Guangdong citizens are directed to carry their state-issued identification at all times. They have spent outside their homes. One firm that the Guangdong police will be setting up off checkpoints throughout the city wherein they will be authorized to check proof of identity. We emphasize that any and all movement not essential to economic activity is not advisable even outside of curfew hours. Your cooperation with these directives is expected and appreciated. We will be repeating this broadcast on the hour every hour until the lifting of the order. Well, that's nice. Um, the cities in town of Guangdong reacted in many ways. Some hunkered down at home. A few secretly relished the pleasure of being able to get away from work for more than an evening and a morning. Others, more diligent or financially constrained than they, braved the checkpoints to work in the stores, offices, and factories. But the moment night fell, and the curfew was in fact, the businesses all closed. And the cities and towns were handed over to the only people that mattered, the police and the protesters. Out of all the signs that nothing was normal and ordinarily economically zealous Guangdong, this was the most obvious. A concession that no business not, was not that usual as usual, and security came before economy, at least for now. A rather unfriendly community. Our recent operations of infiltrating local community groups have proven to be more difficult than initially expected. While some of our plainclothes officers managed to successfully apply for membership in these organizations, the acquisition of any solid evidence has been challenging at best and practically impossible due to the extreme measures applied by the groups to police their own members. So challenge questions and passwords are among the obstructions our agents had to face, resulting in a few of them having lost their cover and being forced to exfiltrate empty-handed. Besides the notable increase of funding towards these communities coinciding with the growing force of the CCL, we cannot strike coincidence with as concrete proof. Despite several more attempts at hunting for hard data linking both of these groups, the self-policing of their members and the lack of any tangible high command within the organizations leave us with no lead to follow, and little gains made with each new mission. We regret to inform you that we will need more time and more resources to further investigate these communities until we can find a leader to work with. We will report on any further developments should they come. We've got the resources. As for time, though, hmm. The numbers are finally dwindling, but underworld of blaze. If you're going to that, please go ahead. God dang it. As Japanese concerns are growing, but an unfriendly lack of faith. The recent bombing of the Imperial Trade Bureau in Hong Kong was an unfortunate consequence of the investigation's sluggish pace, which resulted in not only the death of several key functionaries and civilians, but also the receipt of a grave community key from the commanders of the local ja Japanese garrison, who have grown doubtful in a discreet approach to dismantling the CCL. They believe their campaigns have already proven fruitless, and have gone suggest that we substitute for a stronger, harsher response against the looming threat. While it's not our position to question the authority of the Imperial Army, we do however have a wish to report that we may be on the brink of a breakthrough in our intelligence gathering should you grant us your approval in continuing the ongoing infiltration assignment. We simply require a little more time in order to properly organize the data on these groups. A stronger approach would be wise. Revise our options. Trust your efforts to continue the mission. Yeah, we'll see what happens. If it doesn't go well, then we'll see what happens next after that. I really don't want to decrease growth, but this will decrease Japanese frustration as well and strength. I'm fine with that for now. We do what we must. The pattern shaping. After extensive investigation and gather data gathering by our agents, we were able to properly identify several key figures within the hierarchy of these community groups, mainly lieutenants and organization commissioners or commissars, who are considering instrumental to the plots. Furthermore, we were able to construct a sizable map importing multiple caches owned by these groups, which are sa where they stash money, weapons, propaganda, and other supplies across the three pearls. Finally, we made a breakthrough. However, 
as evidence. It alone is not enough to solidify a link between the community groups and the CCL, which requires us to continue the investigation until that link can be properly established. We have two operations on standby. Awaiting your approval, we can wiretap the communications and examine the transcript for suspicious exchanges, or we can send officers to tail after the merchandise being held by these groups. Once we receive your orders, the operation will begin immediately, and we'll report again once we've made our findings. I kind of want to track their uh, supplies. Follow the goods. Hopefully it's something de decent. Increase growth even more. We can wait a little bit for that. Bang for the buck. Overview. The explosion, explosive potential of the Committee of Chinese Labor is growing at an alarming pace. Where previous estimations see attached previous forensic and coroner's reports suggest that CCL use of improvised explosive devices as confined to sporadic use and prone to malfunctioning and premature detonation, this assumption is no longer tenable. While clearly constructed in non-specialist facilities, these devices bear a level of sophistication and payload comparable to the paramilitary organizations such as the Northeastern Anti-Japanese United Army. Please view attached documents for further technical information. It is believed that these figures with an advanced knowledge of munitions may be assisting urban insurgents. Mm. Yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to really get this one really down. Um, conclusions. The potential consequences of uh, the explosives and stockpiles currently in possession of the CCL. As identified by embedded cap operation, sulfate operatives are being used in further attacks cannot be understated or allowed. Special Branch Command is recommended to do seriously consider the benefits of continued proximity to CCL leadership against the cost of leaving stockpiles in place. Addendum. Consul General Takashima strongly recommends swift intervention. Took his little patience for dithering nor failure. Kick in the door. Oh, they literally said, just make more. Kick in the door. Probably not a good idea, but we'll see. Losing our grip. A banger whipper. Oh, would you look at this? Special Branch, Kalanistan Affairs Division, Operation Sulfate After Action Report, Operational Direct Objectives. Identify stockpiles of CCL armaments, explosives, and munitions, linking them to key or senior leadership figures within the organization. Oh, got embedded personnel and operational outcomes. The sites of IED manufacturing and storage found by embedded agents and delivered to forensic personnel. Greater insight and tactical and material capacities of CCO gained. Weapon stockpiles raided and large quantities of enemy material were covered and destroyed. Several believed mid to senior figures of CCO leadership in custody. Interrogations ongoing. Overall outcome. Success. Addendum. It is unknown that the whole majority of our CCO explosives have been recovered. If large supplies remain, likelihood uh, the use of their of their use in reprisal attacks is high. Security forces are recommended to be placed on appropriate alert. Keep an eye on cross your fingers. We don't have enough clues due to prior investigations of government control of the regions of Guangdong to surgically strike the CCL. So how do we do that? As we deploy armor against them. Everything for Guangdong. There's no price to be too great to be paid to save Sony Chung Kong's Guangdong. Augmented deployment. A phalanx of police shook out in the streets of the rural city in the Guangdong hinterland. Preparing as they often did to fight the local GFT and CCSLs um, for the control of the city, however, whereas before the result will usually be an indecisive stand-up dispersed only by the customary tear gas canisters, this time the police detachment had an ace up its sleeves and armored car. Instead of the armored car was a Zhujin commander connected to his Japanese superior by radio. Ginger maneuvered the armored car forward. He escorted the police to the target a major thoroughfare blocked by the GFT CCL act joint action. Peering out of the hatch of the armored car, he watches the ordinary defiant protesters melted away before facing the tear gas and water can hastily installed in place of a machine gun on the car's roof. As a peer on the radio congratulated him for a job well done, but the armored car commander felt a certain sense of being watched. Looking around and even up, he saw people in the apartments and store lines, a uh, store's line in the road, he just held clear. To man all of them except the infants were staring at him with more hostility than he'd ever seen, even during that one time he cursed out the entire student council in high school back in the show of tens. Out of an abundance of caution, not at all, and not at all because he was afraid to go of uh, brick bats. No, sir, the armored car commander withdrew back into his vehicle, closed his hatch, and relied on his loudspeaker to get his next orders. By decree, uh, the chief executive. Stage 2. Why do we need Stage 2? The government's plan war planners have been hard to work. Seemingly, millions of policy meetings, memoranda, and internal debates later, three distinct groups had emerged. Now that sufficient material had been found uh, against the CCL, opinions on who to hit first differed. One group recommended cutting out the head of the snake, targeting the CCL leadership. Those would hopefully render the terrorists rudderless and make them easy pickets for the police sweeps. As detractors, though, feared that the new leaders simply pair up with the crowds. Another group's recommended escalating lockdown measures, curfews, sweeps, and break-ins. If the leaders were unable to get together and protests were unable to meet, so the reason he went, then the riots would run out of steam of their own accord. Others, however, argue that this potentially allowed the leadership to escape, as well as stretching already stressed government manpower to an unacceptable extent. The third group, however, emphasized a different target. The Republic of China still had an opportunity to make a decisive intervention in what they still considered part of their homeland. For all this, they thought the government should isolate the Chinese consul general and keep Nanjing in the dark as to what was really happening on the streets. Also, a better effect on how it can deal with the CCL for better or for worse. A great effect. This outcome will depend on China's meddling in the riots. If the streets are ours, the riots will be started with oxygen. 
Well, wow, leaders are terrorists. They also break apart. What about that one? Once bustling, now silent. Hmm. The streets of the Guangdong were distinctly silent compared to the usual. All protesters, oops, pro protesters and pedestrians have been cleared away from the main roads, whose only traffic were the Guangdong riot police milling around. Those occasional large concrete barricades imposed itself over the street, forcing people to find new routes. A curfew had been imposed to tire across entire city blocks, and the officers on the street were very conscious of the timid faces spying at them from the windows of buildings and in smaller side streets. People still tried to gather and protest, but the possibility of larger grounds gathering was severely restricted, and those that could be found themselves either be trapped and beaten by the riot police when they went on the offensive. CCL were naturally alerted to what was happening, as they always were going to be. The help from the authorities was that the organization and leadership would be in disarray, unable to organize or resist the suppression. This would be only the first step. It would soon be to be seen whether the operation would pay off. It only gets worse. Oh, don't you forget about me. Uh, homicide, Hong Kong, Precinct 810. Deputy Chief Kosumoto killed. Chief Naro wounded in drive-by shooting vehicle. 1947 Toyota SA. Place removed. Vehicle and perpetrator unrecovered. Bombing refused uh, container by the entrance to Osaka Road Station, Yuji, Yuji District, Koshu. Warning call placed to authorities two hours before detonation, zero casualties, no significant damage to property. The down of cocktail thrown through the window of Macau Precinct 082. Three officers hospitalized, two in critical condition. Car bombing camp at the headquarters, Panyu District, Tian, Tianhe. Seven dead, 15 injured, a double homicide, two GPF officers found hanging on Haizu Bridge next to a banner reading, plenty of room for more. Must have missed a spot looking for those bombs. What? The outburst. And Koshi, the front lines between the police and the op protesters met. As well, the crowd pushing those at the front were mere inches away from the cold, uh, solid shields of the authorities. One protester, a young man missing fingers from an industrial accident, drew too close to the shield wall and took a baton to the temple. It crumbled to the ground like a broken doll, dragged back by his fellows as others retaliated against the aggressor. One officer received a mighty strike from a makeshift bamboo pike, staggering away from the melee with a face covered in blood. Another felon was dragged in the furious crowd, blows landing on him from all directions. A trio of officers braved the crowd and retrieved for the comrade, shoving back protesters as they did. Rocks began to fall like rain on the police, most bouncing harmlessly off of raised shields or padded helmets. While landing in large projectiles took the toll, however, further splattered on the asphalt street with blood. Return to your homes. This is an illegal demonstration, any and all remaining on the street will be arrested. Boom, the police loudspeakers were repeating the command in the hopes that their repetition would draw compliance, but the fighting went on. Power to the people, justice for the workers, slap dogs, scum, cowards, bullies, fight like men, blared back to the numerous megaphones among the protesters. The resulting deal was enough to drive anyone into distraction as a verbal war raged. Gunfire, the live rounds, demanding acquiescence, broke through the cacophony and sent the protesters fleeing from the police. Dozens slipped away, broken bones and dripping blood for medals, their medals for the day. So I guess we have to go back, huh? Hey, it wasn't super successful, huh? Oh, look at this! Oh, that's nice. Lockdown. Overnight, the city appeared to double its weight in concrete. Traffic came to a halt and work went unfinished. The subway tunnels were emptied, their mouths held under lock and key. Across the major roads and in the space between the neighborhoods, the roadblocks stood at bases heavy enough to stop vehicles dead, with barbed wire tall enough to repel men on foot, at the very least, assuming they came unarmed. That was not the case in all locations, nor could the police hope to be everywhere. Perceived weaknesses were quickly spotted and attempts to break through were made. The fence, however, proved less fragile than the thin chain mesh appearing at first, and the concrete was predictably immovable. Commercial power tools began to cut through but at a pace intolerable to the enraged masses, many who previously had not been part of the riots. And while some posts had been left on man, none had been left unobserved. As soon as they appeared, the drills and cutters were soon abandoned as those welding them uh, were sent away or cut down. Siren patrols sped through their assigned areas, making observations as they went. The cells were isolated, exposed, and the cages locked tight. All that remained was to determine exactly where in the vast concrete landscapes of urban Guangdong the heads of the snake lay and then to bury them to have the concrete swallow them whole, tighter and tighter and tighter. We like them tighter. Now we can negotiate with them, right? I'm saving the political power just in case we don't need to spend it. Battle of the Junction. The pain course through Officer Sun's jaw as he sat slumped against a squad car, gingerly pressing an ice back to the fractured portion of his face. He kept his eyes shut, but the morning light bled into the skull all the same. His thoughts were a combination of inarticulate profanity and animal responses to the pain and sounds beside him. Crashing, bludgeoning, and the soft hit of exploded as the dawn of cocktails, shouting in various proficiencies of Cantonese. Who was winning, Sun couldn't say. And then the noise calmed down. Bellowing and Cantonese commands from his fellow officers were replaced with an indoor voice, Japanese, and uh, radio crackles. Guess we won after all, Sun thought. Then again, he had no idea how well the f fight went in the first place, and he knocked out of, the, of a commission almost as soon as they arrived. He wondered if this meant there'd be any chance of proper medical attention soon. Just as soon as every ga zai with a paper cut was seen to, of course. He noticed some grunts of effort and the dragging feet beside him, then the water spit splashing against his forehead. 
Ron Hell, stupid traitor, came the voice before a grunt of pain came from the same voice. It was presumably shoved into a transport shortly after, but Tsun's eyes remained shut. F you too, buddy, thought, but just before another Joe of Pain took his soul from his body momentarily. His mind rewoke to Officer Leung, uh, kneeling next to him, the only other Chinese in the squad. How's your head, he says. He asked. Tsun only grinned in response. Yes, you work back there, but Control says we got some of the worst of it. It's calm most places. Good for you. You'll be out of commission for the next couple of days since they're throwing us all into the dens. We'll rush the CCL raids. If its radical radicalism is low, it'll be good. We're on our butts until everyone's, everyone's calm. Carefully plan execute. If the radicalism is high, the action will be more successful. Let's so do that one then. Because here, that's pretty bad. Um, I like. I want all positive for us. All positive for us is good. Mantras. We must call once again for calm and determine when tempers are most inflamed. The government promises, as, as it always promised too, to listen to grievances, but voices solve nothing. A violence solves nothing. Voices solve nothing. But violence solves nothing. We're fully aware of the damage is caused by the ongoing rise, but our message remains the same. Guangdong remains a place that will be open forever to business. For companies that abide by our laws, we'll ensure that they're protected in turn. We're concerned to the Republic of China, noted, which constant general song, but we've been saying from the start the internal affairs of Guangdong are not a concern for the Republic any longer. Excuse me. No, that won't be necessary. Please reiterate. To Tokyo, that the government has attention to the situation under control. No, there won't be a need to request support from the army garrison. Yes, exactly what we've been saying for the last few months, and it remains the truth. I understand. I promise. Please. Well, Murta finally put down the phone, the sun had long since set. But in the distance, he could see the faint glow of a g different hundred street battles and fires in the streets. Silhouetting uh, the Koshu skyline against the murky night. To convince others, you must first convince yourself. Losing control. Oh, crap. Nami Umura was known by many names. Nami to her mother and her friends. Officer Umura to her officer's colleagues. Honey to that condensating piece of crap. Hitika. It took Taka from the forensics, but at most she was control or dispatch with a radio set bleeped as if it was on cue. Control this is LC049, negative signs of life at location B37E, en route to the next location over. Acknowledge LC049, uh, LC crossing eyed off the list, control out. I pen over the infuriatingly tiny, letter, tiny lettering of the spreadsheet before finding the correct box. After checking twice to make sure she hadn't eyeballed it wrong and the place was ticked off, just as Sisyphus finished his daily rounds up the hill. Nami, however, much like everyone else in dispatch, had been working overtime for the past week. The list was still nowhere close to full, and the hers was only for the squad cars assigned to her specifically. The brass had come down, they said they wanted a methodical operation. Then they promptly screwed up, uh, screwed off back upstairs. Meanwhile, she could barely stand up to her fellow cop of the industrial strength paint thinner they call coffee between calls. Apparently, the corpos and the Ludco were whining to not high heaven about the delays all this caused, but here Nami was, close to passing out, still on the line, speaking of the devil. Control this is AY441, location at B77U, successfully cleared, requesting two meat wagons for cleanup over. Copy that AY441. Relaying the meat wagons, crews, ETA unknown at this time, hang, hang, hang tight, over. A confirmatory bark came over the line, the connection cutting shortly after. Nami filled the sheet in again. And turned around and look at the brute pot. Just a minute or two without the beep, but just give me a bit of time. We'll be awake just for a little. The beep went off again. God dang it. More efficient because CCO's radicalism was buzz. 80%. Next. Hey, the numbers are 0%. That's good. Happy May, everybody. I love the riots. I am part of the riots. I am the riots. Let's see what the next event says first. House always wins. Oh, look at that. Why and the two compatriots sat at a table in the burned-out building, idly tossing dice back and forth. Kit sat in the corner furthest from the elements, still filling with the radio. They picked up nothing but different condenses of static. The dice clattered around around the bowl, each time coming up with different numbers. Maybe they meant something, maybe they didn't. Nobody was keeping score or even playing any real game, same as ever was. On the distance, a great lot of Koshu had sparked a lot, snuffing out the gentle caress of the moon, and making the small lantern they had brought obsolete. Slogans still littered the walls, and scraps of torn banners, discarded weapons, and general detritus continued to litter the streets as they did, as they were here for now. There had to be something, right? Just a little push more, then things could finally be put right, made better, couldn't they? They were the teeming masses of Guangdong, those who kept, whose blood kept the lights flowing, the margins high. The cops, the army, the executives, guns, and money, or no. Shouldn't be able to keep up with that. This absurd fever dream they'd all been forced to accept as reality couldn't just reassert itself, just like that. The rest couldn't all be gone now, could they? Couldn't it all be dead, behind bars were given up. The chill night wind gave no answer. We could, why well, begin before trailing off, seeing the looks on the others' faces. He had no idea how much he would finish that sentence anyway. In the distance, a sound could be heard. Because we sufficiently weakened the CCL, the dismantlement proceeded smoothly. The CCL is no more. Nice. Increase the government control. Decrease the Chinese government support. Decrease the government despair by 35%. Japanese frustration by 30%. More political power. Fantastic. We terminated them. That's actually went more smooth than I thought. I remember the first or second time I did this. It was actually very frustrating doing this, but... Hey, we did a good job, y'all. Cast off. 
A thumping boom of, on asphalt, a boom of boots on asphalt pounded louder and louder in Guy's ears. A throwing of shouting protesters approached a gangplank. A contingent of red faced, lightly dressed a police officers barreling after them. Guy's supervisor on the Star Ferry had seen them seconds before and was already waving for the rabble rousers to come aboard. Running through the plank, Guy was the first to position himself at the railing, ready to heave it overboard. Turning, he saw the ships come alive from behind him, other crew members preparing themselves to cast off from port. Uh, ropes were untied, anchors lifted, and engines roared to life in a flurry of activity even as the protesters began pouring into the deck. Hauled came a breathless shot from behind the final stragglers, sheltering criminals as illegal, handing them over at once. Just as Dai was about to push a gangplank away, he noticed a man in a battered, a threadbare suit hobbling just ahead of the streams of policemen. Swearing, Dai leapt onto the pier even as a police uh, boots met his frame, uh, wooden frame. He grabbed a hold of the aging man and practically threw him over the side of the ship, leaving back on board in a feat of inhuman strength he'd never imagined himself capable of. Cast off holes, holler the fairies captain from above the confused mass, and moments just as Dai saw the first officer reach a plank, it fell away into the ocean, and the star fairy began, uh, began what was sure to be their final voyage. As they sailed away from the dock, insults and taunts were thrown back at the cops, Dai decided to focus on tending to the recently wounded and what was gathered a police charge. Back on the pier, policemen panned in blue shirts and shorts, adhering final voyage and smoke over ashes. If you close your eyes and listen, sitting in the quiet of the day, it was clear the rights were over. Guangdong endured many long weeks of blaring police sirens and loud bells of shouted slogans and unrestrained anger. They had only recently ended, but now they seemed so distant, so unreachable. When those discordant sounds disappeared, they were replaced by an uncomfortable, unnatural silence. But whether out of a sense of duty or just because it felt like the right thing to do, the rhythms of life eventually returned to fill the void, and soon the silence vanished, replacing with a rather different set of sounds. Across the three pearls, you could hear the harsh high, scraping of posters being removed. The young men worked hard, heaving mounds of rubble and ash to clear the streets, so beads of sweat fell into places where blood had once been shed, and of course, the low clucking of the factories had returned. A constant metronomic heartbeat that confirmed the Guangdong was indeed alive again. The riots have left many scars across all of society, and it wouldn't be easy to repair what could be fixed. Yet yeah, what could still be mended. Slowly but surely, things were settling again, not to into the old ways, something had changed, and a new normal was beginning to emerge. And so, step by step, uh, Guangdong marches into the future. Through all the tumult and chaos of the Guangdong riots, Murray Takeo and his staunch ally, Li Keqing, forgives, uh, bless his for, uh, dead wife now, have regained the trust of the citizens of Guangdong through careful handling of the rioters. Li Keqing's family, however, was irrevocably hurt by the hostage crisis, as his wife had to meet a tragic end. Terrible. Now we're looking old. Custodian of a dream. Yeah, we're, we're getting old, man. Calming of the Guangdong riots. Has AI ever done this in my own games? I don't think I've played. I don't think I've played a really long campaign in TNO with, I mean, since this update came out, huh? Problematic, yeah. And yet, there's a sign of return to the relative of calm after the destruction wrought by the oil crisis. The Guangdong riots, brought about due to mass societal anger at the living, uh, at a segregated system, have at least calmed down. Finally, tense negotiations with the government and a harsh crackdown. Uh, I've recently yielded calm on the streets of Guangzhou and other major cities within the corporatocratic state. The chief executive has recently made a communique indicating total success and about a return to business one way or another. Tokyo has indicated congratulations from Nanjing. On the other hand, there is no comment. One less crisis then. Yeah. That's still really bad. This growth is not bad. The smoke clears. As sun rises above the fading columns of smoke of Akoshu, Hong Kong, and Macau, Guangdong endures. The vision of Amrita Kao and Li Keqing endures as the corporate sigils of Sony Chung Kong shine down on the cityscape and settlements down in the countryside. The distance have been bought off or forced underground once more. The IJ is standing down to the other corporates whose fallen disregarded by the Guangdong's greatest crest has been crowded in silence. We and only we claim to represent the interests of the people, our loyal employees from which Guangdong's prosperity derives. We clear the streets of rubble and ruin, cleaning the ash from the pyre of progress. Fantastic. What do we got here? The regions of Guangdong looking fantastic. Is there any doubt as we, uh, for us to lose con police control? No, eh, Koshu, maybe. Maybe they're in uh, Macau? Hong Kong, though? Yeah, maybe. Let's get close. Nice. Yeah, three weeks until their next product cycle. Just in time. A state build on wishful thinking. Dreams deferred. Fantastic. People's faces. Oh, how about... Uh, Guangdong has become far more humane, far more nice than it once was. The worst of the discrimination is gone. People are being paid. Deaths by a karoshi, an overworker, a thing of the past. With people far from merely surviving live. With a brief vignette of peace, they are now free to look for, not at the be not at the beaten feet. Best of all of us, they know very well just who will provide them all this bounty. They rely on us, to Sony, to Hong Kong, to provide for them and their families. Look at us at uh, all times, and we most most willingly provide, as is our right and duty. Embers amidst ash, the pa pace of public demonstrations have noticeably slowed. Arrests for the most destructive crimes have fallen. The proceedings of the worst offenders and the riots will conclude in the next few months. The assembled members of the Marita's cabinet all shared a sigh of relief as Commissioner Morris wished off a projector. 
The Guangdong rats were up with a fever spell that spread across much of the police. Police populace finally breaking into the Guangdong Federation of Tradesmen and the Chinese Commi uh, Committee of Chinese Labor faded into irrelevance. I spoke with the Consul General Takashima this morning, Matsushi added. A contented smile crossing his face for the first time in months, so Tokyo is beyond pleased. As the meeting concluded, Morita put Lee aside. The two looked down at the empty streets below Morita's office, the telltale marks of anti government graffiti still firmly visible on the pavement. We did what we had to, Morita said quietly, you understand, right? We can't undo what's happened, Lee demurred. Looking out of the city, neither of us came here thinking we would make enemies. Guangdong's success is only the answer we have for them. Not because it'll satisfy them, but because it'll prove them wrong. You're dodging the question, Kishing, Morita replied. If you ask me about methods, then I don't have an answer for you. I won't forget the smell of tear gas anytime soon, and neither will you, at least Data, but we're both still here. The future is all that matters. Guangdong flickers them back into life. Our new economy. The great state of Guangdong will recover as it has done many times before. We'll use adversity to gain ever greater triumphs for ourselves. Powered by the energetic labor of a loyal, dedicated workforce and backed by the brilliance of engineers in Sony Chung Kong. Those uh, among the Chinese, Zhujin, and Japanese expatriates who chose to join their hands with us shall propel the Navy, uh, the Navy, shall propel the sphere, uh, nay, the whole world into the new future. Uh, we of uh, Sony and Chung Kong shall provide, uh, guide, and guard them in this endeavor. It is elevated and correct, and a right and duty to do so. Perron is dead. Goodbye, Perron. More things change. As Lee Chun walked into the coach on a weekend night with his two younger siblings, he realized that it had been ten years since his family's traumatic arrival in Guangdong. Things had changed uh, very much indeed. When they had come in, the place had been a heck hole filled with misery and instability. The people where they, they saw were IJA and Camp Tai men, police officers, and beaten down fellow residents trying to survive till their next meal. Now with more order, or less order more or less restored, the government seemed eager to return to normal as soon as possible. The riot era checkpoints were dismounted, and the remaining patrolmen were all that vigilant. The city was crowded, loud, and full of life, and funnily enough, Chun thought those last two words described his younger siblings well enough right about now. He turned back to their chat chattering. Hi, hey, and why? By now, we're nearly finishing school. As a result, we're talking about the future. Why well, was uh, thinking about work? I think being a clerk or taking a clerical position over to Chun Kong would be great. Uh, hi, Scott. Do you want to sell your soul to the chief executive? Why well, rolled her eyes back, firing him. Sam, the guy took a Sony Engineering Scholarship and a place in the dormitories. Ooh, this wasn't good, Chun thought. He made to interrupt them before they started fighting for real. Look at you, I'm proud of you. All of a sudden, Chun noticed something in front of him and was able to shove his siblings and himself out of the way of a Chun Kong motorcade barreling down the street under the police escort. What, was that a high ass of siblings who nodded in a shop? What the heck, the Japanese would run them over at any time, but Chun Kong? The more they say the same. Stand on reserves, as a world historical disaster has been, the oil crisis slows down. And recovery continues. Regular life in Guangdong crime is not uh, among its many facets. Research itself. Petty crime, biases, smuggling, all these things remain much the same as they once were. Things have changed, true. The Kampai Tower are more or less driven out, and the police run far better than they once did. But for all the crime, they doesn't really have to seem to have gone away. Looking at this, we question whether criminals are just criminals, or in fact the desperate who are possessed of no other choice in Guangdong's hyper-competitive economy. Our new economy. Before 1972, from Magadan to Monterey and beyond, it was unheard of the corporations, even closely allied ones, would hold joint board meetings. There would often be liaisons between one company and the other at the meetings, and the details and plans would frequently be shared, but until that day in Koshu, such proposals considered impossible. Yet that was a result of the combined Sony CK order in Guangdong, obtained by a history of joint work also unheard of in prior corporate history. And the stories too were unprecedented. The boards heard reports about the increasing do dominance of Guangdong by the governing coalition in the commercial sphere. Record profits were being taken, and already loyal customers were buying even more, and Sony and CK were pre penetrating throughout Guangdong. The rivals continued to operate well in their respective niches, but everyone used Gu Sony and Chung Kong's equipment regardless. They had no choice. The meeting was crowned by the introduction of the three newest members of the board, all Zhu Jim. First was a Wong Ho Fai, the old Star Wars auditor and inspector who decided to seek a career change and become Sony's head of marketing. Then came two friends that had begun their careers guiding each other through a CK welcome ceremony. Li Hyo Lam, who had assumed responsibility for Chung Kong's pharmaceuticals and more importantly, says Man Hai, or Hei, or Hai, who was remit was to deepen the Sony CK presence in the Republic of China proper. As the two men and women, one woman took a bow, the assembled board members applauded politely. Even the Japanese who had, had to a man realized that at Sony and Chung Kong's one dissent meant nothing next to what one did, felt no shame in joining the plaudits for the new colleagues. So it is the new in the new economic order. So to Japan. Uh, we're going to so to Japan. Just because they don't like us that much right now. Um, you know what? I'm going to decrease Chinese government support. It'll go up eventually as time goes on. So we'll be okay. This is god awful. Oh, hurting me. Happy June, though, everybody. No riots here. Oh, look at the social stuff. GDP per capita from December goes, no, 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 for half a year. Jesus Christ. Population grew. Pars shrank. Women joined. People learned how to read. 
Half a million died from preventable diseases, you know. Military personnel increased by a couple hundred thousand, I think. Not bad overall. Promise in the Pearl Delta. It was a pleasant day in Guangdong that at long last I finally began to recover from the hell that was oil crisis and then attended riots. And celebrating all these facts, Yamal Hiroshi was attending a dinner event. Uh, with businessmen and representatives of Chong Kong and Sony engaging in pleasantries and mild drinking. Stanley Ho, the legitimate businessman, not that Yamauchi really cared about what his business actually was, our financial secretary was in attendance. His usual conviviality and jocular nature on full display, while Ho went through the motions of a brief speech about the prosperity of the state and the boons in which the gambling industry had brought upon Guangdong, praising the efforts of the contracted businesses, such as Nintendo, which allowed for success, Yamauchi went into a reverie com contemplating his words. They sounded familiar for some reason. Ah, oh, that's it. It reminds me of Marita's promises way back at the start, Yamauchi remembered. He would not have been in this relatively prosperous position if not for the Marita administration and it moved him to a certain sense of gratitude. Someone tapped him on the shoulder to see when a toast was being made. After lifting his glass and drinking from it, Yamauchi excused himself from the event, bidding farewell to Stanley Ho and the others. When Ho, curious as to why he was leaving, asked the reason, Yamauchi merely shrugged. There's always more work to be done, Mr. Ho. At that, those listened, listening laughed uh, uproariously and slapped him on the back in approval. What a trooper. Keep it up then, Mr. Yamauchi. Our home, our way of life. The Marita and Lee promised themselves a decade ago that Guangdong would become more than just a place to survive. It would be a place that they, cast adrift from Japan and caught in the grinding gears of poverty, could call their home. Now the way of life is now that of an entire nation. Capitalism and enterprise will be the means by which the Chinese, and especially the growing Zhujian professional classes, will make a home of Guangdong, despite being caught up in historical happenstance. The Japanese will adapt as Marita did so many years ago, or the new Guangdong will pass them by. Guangdong will be more than fa uh, farms found under harbor, it will be a nation under Sony and Chongkong's trademark. And soon you forget you live in a world of Sony and Chongkong's design. We change our status of all through the line, Rock Spirit. Hey, just find corruption. Want the government support. Silicon years. Hey, we're back to Silicon years. The new normalcy. Lam Hyo Hyo Sun was out on a night beat and a plane close for the first time I felt like an eternity. The order come from the commissioner to stand down the reserves, but they did not mean vacation from police's duties. Thus, we're carried on as they had before. Lam had to admit being in usual plain clothes felt better than being in uniform. His words were, of course, to be normal, and he could do that quite well. But it was enough to shake at the feeling of people eyeing him warily in the streets, thinking that they knew him from someplace. Um, and he, even he, a veteran officer that he was, couldn't feel, but feel more edge around the people in uniform. But it was the riots after effects, Lam supposed. But the riots themselves had managed to stop him doing his job. What could the resident you all paranoia do to stop him? People would come around eventually, and they would understand. He has. He had already. The normalcy was fine at a minimum. The chief executive would provide. Lamb's river is interrupted by a fight breaking out at a bar head. Men spit out of the store, tumbling in the streets. A bundle of cash fell to the ground, and a separate bag fell near it. As it burst apart on the floor, syringes rolled out. The man on the losing end of the fight was in a worn, dirty suit with a torn necktie. As Lamb rushed to break up the fight, getting his badge and weapons ready, he wondered what made someone that ought to have been working on a good job turn to drugs. Clearly, he had lost the game of Black Guangdong, because even after all Marita had done, desperation still wore a familiar face. Police, stand down! I don't mind doing maybe a slight bit of corruption, so we get a lot more facts. Oh, I don't want to do that. Definitely not that one. Um, increase people's product interest? Sure. It's cheap, and we can always lower corruption. Eyes on the horizon. With the immediate needs of Guangdong rats met, it is time for us to look beyond Guangdong's borders. We are at last free to look, get back to what we were doing before everything went to hell in a handbasket, faster than Li Kishin could say, Am Ga Khan. As such, let's return to what we do best, selling, selling, and selling. Not to mention selling. It's time for us to make the rounds of Tokyo, now and hopefully a further field. Surely the next deck will be better than the last. We uh, hope it will be anyways. Detachment. Hey, we're done building stuff. Look, up. Look at that. Wow, we actually are done building stuff up, huh? No, we're not. Prisons for the population. There we go. And for joint air operations. Detachment. Miss Yasukawa of Kantan Fujin Koran, of course, right this way. The hotel waiter didn't seem to recognize Yoshiko, which was only to be expected. It had been years since she made her way to one of the gilded ballrooms of Koshi's premier hotel, the exclusive haunt of the Japanese executives and officers who still called Guangdong their temporary home. It uh, once preferred her preferred haunt as well. She found herself mimicking the motions cur courtesies of high society out of long dormant habit. A series of and a nine, how do you do's and hush gossip about earnings, personal decisions, or sort of family affairs. And that was all there was, she found. Even if she heard more Cantonese than the vast majority of Japanese, such was the creeping influence of the chief executive Marita and the Kishin's clique of Zushin executives, now coming into their own. She found herself without much to contribute. She could glean any number of useful leads from a conversational fragment, the hallmark of a good reporter, but it was clear that she had ceased to be a decent conversational song ago. After 30 minutes of ghost-like gliding between the standing tables and the hors d'oeuvres, rarely acknowledged and barely seen, she found herself standing alone near the exit, a lone figure cradling an empty flute of champagne. 
The few meters of carpet separating her from the glittering scene ahead, a company of men and women dressed in their finest, celebrating their survival against the odds, felt vaster than an ocean. They were a living dream. Uh, a fantasy of asking about the clouds with no certain footing on the material world below. A familiar, nostalgic dream for Yoshiko, but a dream nonetheless. Everything important happens when you're awake. We didn't really get much about her or Lam Hao Sun and all this stuff that has happened, but beyond that, Chukwo. Let's proclaim an end to an old, outdated industrial paradigm. For all the Saijima Ruzio or Nishi Okishi no, Nobusuka might protest otherwise, the industry of the future will have little and less to do with steel, chemicals, and machinery. The Manchurians are welcome to cling to the rusting behemoths and creaking factories if they want to, but we have seen the right path and is paved in silicon. Electronics are truly the way and the wave of the future. The demand for them is universal and transcends all immutable characteristics. It is time for us to take on the world as is our right. That Manchuria reclined in a throne of wrought steel and blackened suit, we have seen the future of a world defined by silicon transistors and microchips. Reality. Uh, in the end, the only thing that's changed is that everyone wears Sony or Chung Kong lapel pins. Yoshiko Scott, as she finished re uh, retelling the day's events, seated comfortably at a back table in a Koshu bar. And I'm still chasing vagrants, addicts, and petty criminals on the streets. Lam groaned into his beer, having shared his uniform and occasional riot related follow up. I'm sure that makes you popular, Yoshiko said. No, as popular as I've ever been, Lam replied, which means not at all. Oh, we're done with almost done with this one. Uh, actually, if that's the case. 5%, that's fine. The two sat quietly for a few minutes, looking out of the bar as patrons. There was little talk of politics, caught between the now exhausted mercy of the government, the floating world of the Japanese, and the daily slights that came with being a Chinese, the Zuzian, so for what they could get. Material advancement, after all, was still within their control. And where does that leave us, Yoshiko asked. I'm out of a place in the salons, and you're drinking with me. Can't imagine that it does wonders for either of our images. The heck with that lamb muttered. Life's not that simple. If it were, this place wouldn't be full night after night. The night went on, with air suffused with a raucous melange of Cantonese and Japanese, the two languages of necessity and convenience that the Zuzian shared in common. Birds of a feather did indeed tend to flock together, if only because they belonged nowhere else. That was at Guangdong in 1972. I have a story for you, Lampine said. It's outside the city. So interest is going to be 100%, but quality, not so good. Now, you know what? We'll burn some relationships here. Burning all the relationships. If nearly getting flattened by a corporate uh, motorcade earlier that morning hadn't already left a bad taste in Li Chun's mouth, it was meaning that the Guangdong's Federation of Tradesmen representative was just nauseating. It's over. The representative's words were terse, even as he stared Chun down with a steely glare. We've gone as much as we can, we now need to disperse. What about the Committee of Chinese Labor? Chun had argued back, digging in his heels. We bled on the streets with them for months, and now they're, they're, we're leaving them? It's too late to worry about him. We made all our choices. The representative didn't mince his words, clearly reciting a prearranged script for signaling for Chun to leave. After being escorted out by two men, the impeccable build matched with inscrutable expressions. Chun found himself gazing listlessly at, at the passing traffic on the road home. To anyone unfamiliar with Guangdong, it seems as if the riots had never occurred at all. The clutter, debris, and acrid smoke had seemingly overnight been replaced with a reassuring hum of business as usual, and then the stream of vehicles and passed by. I thought back to a moment years ago, where he once suggested a change in a factory to his Zhujian boss, only for said boss to run away with the credit. He thought then that it could make a difference if that things would be different. Chun's eyes stopped at a bar, filling up with the evening clientele, looking for souls and company through the bottoms of empty bottles. Maybe it was just time to join him. Better start somewhere now than better than ever. He was shown to be at a table. I saw a couple already present there and chuckled. They were strangers except for the time and place they shared. In the 1972 Tokyo meetings, it's been a good long while since we last updated Tokyo. In fact, it's been a good long while since they even checked in on us. Though we do not like being bothered by bureaucratic annoyances we, who have to have everything explained to them, this can't be sustained forever. So Chief Executive Morita will pack his bags and return to Japan for the first time in a long time. Having departed in shame and ignominy, he shall return in glory, the shining light and example of the great East Asian core prosperity sphere. Or at least that's what we hope our esteemed overlords will say. Surely Tokyo will be eager to hear of our success. Fixation, though. Where most of Koshi was well and truly dark by the time Morita finished his work, the uppermost floors of the Chung Kong's office towers were still brightly lit. A uh, lighthouse floating in the urban sea, Morita sighed as he saw a solitary light through his limousine's window before signaling his driver to change direction. After being shown through the by, by the night receptionist and the guards, there were also so many more guards these days, Murita stood forlornly in front of the Lee's desk, the silence broken only by the scratching of Lee's pen. Something important, Lee's voice was flat, mechanical. You could, could have called. Nothing important, Murita rubbed his back of his uh, uh, neck, unsure of how to respond to uh, Lee's blunt query. But I figured I might find you here, even if you tell everyone you're getting your rest, the lights up here are all on, on all night, every night. Lee didn't respond, so scratching out a set of minuscule notes in the margins of a business plan, Murita shifted uneasily on his feet before cutting to the chase. Kishin, you need a rest, or 
Rassily stabbed his pen to the paper with a shaking hand with a dull thud, letting the ink blot out his notes with a growing, blood-like stain. So easy for you to say when you have a family waiting for you, both here and back in Japan, if you really felt like it. Mirita felt his eye twitch at Lee's barb, even as Lee himself barely rubbed his bloodshot eyes. But there's hardly anything he could say in response. Not when Lee's family was either in the hospital or consigned to a funerary run or a funerary urn. I won't lose this company. If not for my sake, then for my son's. I know what it's like. Good God. Hey, incredible N. That was great quality. The way beyond. Sen Liao, financial secretary of the city of Guangdong, had a different concern on his mind than the usual finances and stock nonsense. No, he was something far dear to his heart. The work of his trading and smuggling organizations were prepared for an unprecedented expansion. He turned into the conversation. There was talk of record profits, of great movements of goods, electronics and otherwise, and any number of other things. But wait a moment, these people weren't showing any imagination. All he was hearing was Guangdong, China, and Japan. This wouldn't do. All you people are talking about is moving goods through the sphere. Everyone turned to look at him curiously. What do you mean, sir? Stanley spread his hands. Come on, you lot, dream a little. As it stands, we of Guangdong are the very envy of the world. A center of electronics, a vision of the future. Why shouldn't we dream bigger? We're the light of the sphere. Leaving the Venturians behind, I know. I should know. I work there. A light entered their eyes as Stanley pulled a map down and began tapping at it. The Americas, Europe, India, the whole world is out there looking for the goods that only we of Guangdong can provide. Gentlemen, it's time to go global. No one remembered that who started clapping, but Ho's remark was met with wild applause by the simple workers within a few mo moments. Ho soaked it all in. There's work to be done. Let's be about it. I work need be doing. Stanley Ho would be in the middle of it all. <coughs> I know what it's like. Say, Ibuka's gaze a dard darted from the bowl of Shumai onto Matsushita. Lee hasn't popped up anywhere in public for weeks now. Uh, Matsushita peered into his bespectacled face. The lights from all around Kantonken, dancing off Ibuka's lenses, were unfallingly cold, yet somehow the pair of eyeballs behind, not, not so much anymore. Leaving the rest of us behind, I see, he shrugged. If it's his choice to turn his back on this nation, he's supposed to co pilot, we might as well let him. Whatever responsibilities the Guangdong he chooses to throw away from now on, we picked right back up anyway. Matsushita then returned to his plate of dumplings, unaware of the frost devouring his companion's face. So, Li Keqing's son chose to lose his mother then, by your logic? Ibuka's lips trembled. So, the poor boy chose to shut himself off from the rest of the world altogether, as more and more people in the press are already saying. Nobody gets to choose what nightmare befalls his loved ones, Matsushita, or whatever uh, or not, they'll be the same ever again thereafter. And this feeling, this helplessness of not knowing what the heck you're supposed to do to bring him back, he paused, raising his glass as a sip of wine trickled down his throat. Trust me, you wish, wouldn't wish it even on your worst enemy if you knew what it was like. It's true, Matsushita nodded half heartedly, setting his chopsticks aside. What also is true, however, is that it's the first time Rita and Lee are busy with something, with anything else other than screwing us, us two over. Sentiments aside, I believe you wouldn't say no to a chance for Marita to turn to us for help, or for one of your proposals to slip in and let go through the side door. He book aside and wiped away something lingering on his face. A wetness. I know, I just maybe things shouldn't have ended up like this. I suppose I only have one more thing to say to our friend up there. May God have mercy on us all. Fair bill. Does so that increase 12.5%, huh? Business in Nanjing. During the same time period, Li Keqing will go to Nanjing for business with a view on representing Guangdong in the heartland of the Republic of China. It stands to reason that everyone will recognize that Guangdong is destined to remain firmly in place, since Chung Kong and Sony sell just as much as in China as they do anywhere else. The sure continue to prosperity, though. Li will meet with his various business partners and contacts in Nanjing with a view on working out a better relationship. As China grows, Li thinks Guangdong can surely help accelerate its progress and gain something for itself in the meantime, and it would be wise to cultivate new prospects in China. Unofficial business. The charter plane had just stopped. Uh, well, in short of the terminal upon arriving at the Hanada airport, towed neatly in front of a waiting air stair an unfurled vermilion carpet. Chief Executive Marita tried and failed to hide a self-satisfied grin on the display, spotting a gaggle of reporters gathered behind the Japanese government delegation standing at attention to receive him. Welcome home, Chief Executive, Consul General Takashima remarked glibly, accepting his coat from a flight attendant, first time getting the VIP treatment. Yes, Marita replied, instinctively reaching for his passport in his coat pocket before stopping himself. Not exactly used to just embarking straight into a photo shoot. Appearances matter, especially when dignitaries are involved. Takashima gave a slight nod of the head, before men, men motioning Marita forward towards the exit, or after you. Marita's mind raised as a head stewardess, second the door released to handle, straight in his tie, straight in his Sony lapel pin. Stay poised, smile for the camera, shake every diplomat's hand, remember the agenda for the first meeting with the foreign minister. Don't forget your talking points with the prime minister. Start over, survive. Marita blinked as a gust of cold air blew into the cabin, blowing away the faint echo of the only thought he had had when he fled Japan almost 20 years ago. He stepped firmly out in the uh, stairway, descending into the waiting crowd, from exile to honor guest. Hey, that's is looking better now, too. Parabellum. Komai Kenichiro was in a good mood, the best mood he had been in since the time he had duped Ibuka in recommending him for the Legislative Council. 
Sitting in his office in the Koshu headquarters of Hitachi, one of the officers of the former head of Yasuda of Guangdong, he took a draw from a cigarette and sat back languidly. The Hitachi Corporation was on command of Guangdong, after all. It was Marita that was chief executive, not Kamai, but neither Marita nor Li held the desired level of control, but it was more than enough to satisfy him for the time being. A phone call came in from Jingjing. The phone, or the voice, on the other hand, was congratulatory. Well done, Kamai. Your methods, if rather underhanded, got the job done wonderfully. I can tell we made the right decision, sending you south like that, as Kumai preened, the Mangyo executive got to business. Now, what can I do for you? Kumai smirked but kept his tone early as always. Well, we'd like more help to carry the success of the past. More money, more overseers and reliable workers, he said. With an implication both men knew. More commitment and whatnot, the usual. Um, I'm actually going to choose this one. Slightly more corruption, we can get reduced uh, corruption later. Uh, that I can do definitely, but what should I tell the others to sweeten the deal for them? Uh, that the CEO of Hitachi. Smile cruelly, but you know that already. Uh, influence for the Tashi Guangdong, both above and below the table. His interlocutor's smiles obvious even through the phone. Minds elsewhere. Whatever his personal feelings, Mirita found the luster of his diplomatic welcome wore out quickly once he saw what lay underneath, which wasn't much. The foreign minister had peppered him with questions about politics in China since the Western insurrection. They have any talk of investment to the last five minutes. The prime minister had been th 30 minutes late, delayed in the diet by urgent discussions. Even the business community had changed its tune. Where Marita had expected to be made an apology tour, Japanese investors had always been lukewarm towards him. The riots hadn't helped at all. They had always been, instead of been received with a certain urgency, bombarded with questions from all sides. China's politics, its economy, more importantly, its future. Marita answered question after question from men whose unease was etched deeply into their brows, leaving him with a question of his own. Um, something had happened. It was happening in China that had far eclipsed the rise of Guangdong. As Marita said on the return to flight home, Mulling over said question, you saw Consul Jinon Takashima coming up from the aisle with a disgruntled expression. It looks like your visit was as unsettling as mine was, Consul General. Is it ob so obvious, Takashima Fiun? My summon in Guangdong is going to be extended again. Something about steady hands at tough times. Funny, seems like everyone's worried about China these days, Murray said, and with the rats, I'm not as up to date as people think I am. Consul General, is that going to be a problem with the coming storm? So much can change in a decade. Such is true outside Guangdong's borders as within them. Beyond the borders of Guangdong, transforming itself into the pearl of the sphere, Japan and China eye each other warily. Tokyo remains consumed with internal politics, paying less heed to our triumph than the latest crisis engulfing the sphere at large. Our connections with China tell affirmative plans, meetings we are not invited to, to that speak of larger ambitions behind China's economic revival, a political awakening, a call to arms. As the new decade beckons and the horizon darkens, Marita and Li must make ready to meet the future of Guangdong will be swept away by history. A normal business. Uh, Chairman Li, we need to go make this flight now. Uh, we have 9%, 9%, 9%. We can get forever. Uh, sure, why not? Of course, Li Kishin clasped his briefcase shut, taking a second to make sure everything was in order. It was a formality. He had already checked every contract and every proposal, detailing Chung Kong's ambitious plans expanding into China to an immense before. He turned back to survey his office as the secretary repeated herself. Ground bookcases uh, framed the spacious room with the black leather sofas inviting visitors to recline in splendor uh, around a glass coffee table. The entire setup was anchored by Ali's mahogany desk, polished to a glimmering shine in front of the window wall. A skyline of Hong Kong, including the government office, that old repurposed bastion of British capital, shrunk into the waters of Port Shori, a statue reduced before Ali's new throne. He'd be back soon, though, uh, Li thought. He might have had his doubts during the riots, didn't everyone? But almost going to reassert itself, and this was normal now. Twenty minutes later, Lee watched the streets speed by, observing the fruits of his efforts as the motorcade advanced towards Kai Tak Airport. There were no more potholes, no and power lines crisscrossed the skies where nets had once hung. These were less maimed beggars, more smiling children, at least until Lee's cars passed, then they shied away, their expressions morphing for a single instant out of respect or resentment. Strange we should be taking the same flight to Nanjing. Consul General Zhang Zhiguang was waiting for him on the airport tarmac, tapping his feet impatiently at the foot of the boarding stairs. It seems we both have been called for consultations in China proper. They were silent for the entire journey, unnerving rumors. Every meeting had proceeded on time. Every presentation had been received with due applause and attention. Every contract had been signed as agreed. Nothing been out of the ordinary, nothing in yet. Mm, 2%. Lee couldn't see any path forward. There had been no talk about future expansion, tops, or opportunities at unseized. He had been shown respect and only respect without a hint of human wrath, or without a hint of human warmth. Now, as his motorcade uh, ran through the streets of Nanjing, the uh, gendarmes waving Lee's vehicle through with the downcast and sullen gazes, he caught glimpses as to why. In fact, every fast in Nanjing, shopkeepers, passerbys, and even the children, he could see a current of apprehension, pulling their visages and stiffening their movements, a pantomime of normality. Guangdong had never been received warmly by Nanjing, and Li had been out on the receiving end of uh, limp handshakes and cold glares before that, but it had never precluded discussions of money and what to do with it. Guangdong had capital and the Chinese did not, and Li was more pal palatable than anyone else Japanese. Or anyone Japanese. But money didn't seem to open the doors it used to, and that worried Li more than any frigid reception. The situation at the airport was no better. More Japanese businessmen than usual now with their families getting out for goods. 
And as they left through the gates, younger Chinese were arriving in droves relating tales of being told to come home for their own safety. And one last word delivered by Chung Kang employee Sing Li Off, there is talk of reunification, of war, if it comes to it. If not by President Gao Zonggu, and then by somebody else. Nothing was normal anymore. Ah, uh, 40% poverty rate, huh? It's not bad. What lies ahead? So that's it, Maria asked, co a color receding from his face. Nothing about the future business, just rumors. Lee w w lowered himself wearily on the chair opposite Marita's, next to a stony face let Stanley help. Whispers in high places. Of reunification, that means war. Marita let the word cast a frigid chill in the chief executive's office, sinking into a seat. I mean, it might not be a war, but I wouldn't get my hopes up, Stanley shot back in his gaze, deadly serious. If Nanjing's awash in rumors and fleeing Japanese, I guarantee you Tokyo's getting nervous already. You're wondering why Tokyo didn't give you the time of day? That that's why. Three fell silent. Uh, uh, mutely watching the languid procession of traffic and ferries on the Pearl River, a uh, twinkling procession of lights flickering in the dying daylight, serene, tranquil, and blissfully removed from the gathering maelstrom across from the border and beyond the sea. Ten years, Marita muttered, his voice barely above a whisper. Ten years, Bill Guangdong. Our home. Lee and Stanley mentally finished Marita's unspoken thought. More than familiar with what Guangdong meant to him, to all of them, even as the Japanese and the Chinese resented them in equal measure, this was all they would ever have. We have to be ready for whatever comes. Lee broke the silence, so Stanley nodded grimly beside him, and there's not a lot of time. A new decade begins. 5%. That goes down by how much percent every month? I'm quite in the barracks. That wasn't good at all. Nagano should get the thought. This wasn't. A phone rang. Disrupting Nagano's worried thoughts. I was expected a phone call from the uh, general staff. I mean, no hopes for what was going to be said. Still, it was not a question of why or lie to superiors, so he told the truth. The forces did far better than I gave them credit for. The rights were contained without any need for IJA deployment. To that, the general staff had but one thing to say, yes, that's what we will understand. Nagano continued, thank you, sir. I need one major thing, however. In light of recent rumors out of China indicating an undesirable degree of uh, erudentism, we need reinforcements for the IJA garrison in Guangdong. The situation is deteriorating far quicker than we thought, and we might need Guangdong as a beachhead for an intervention we... At that, the field marshal on the other end of the line cut him off. No, general, there's no need. Nagano tried to interrupt, but he was rebuffed. Did you not just say that the security forces have things well in their hand? Are we not familiar with the exp experience of proxy conflicts, which is surely given what they need to fight? No, General, your orders stand. Keep working with the Guangdong government and strengthen the capacity when they in inevitably come to our aid. Nagano couldn't get a word in edgewise before the phone line went dead. Nagano's rage overwhelmed him, and he threw his cap at the opposite wall from his desk. Unlike his out-of-touch superiors, he had no reason to believe that Guangdong would stay with Japan, and they were looking for an excuse to further sell in the garrison. Clearly, then, he had no choice but to come up with new plans. He shouted for a secretary, Give me Okoi and mi, mi, uh, Miyazaki at once, and a million lights. We don't have very much Japanese approval, but we have a lot of Chinese approval, man. Nice. I've stopped getting excited over my paycheck. I'm going to be in the dorms forever, so what's the point? Li Chun laughed nervously, staring at his noodles as Zhang, the new man, complained over lunch. The sides of brisket and choy sum were apple distractions compared to the thin kong yi of years past. <coughs> How could Chun tell Zhang about his family's good fortune? That their hovel had been molded into something like a home, no matter how crowded it felt with why and hay. And a fortune willed it, they too might have places of their own. Uh... Oh, that one went out. Uh, uh, far hours south of Koshu, Lam, Kalsun, and Yasukawa Yoshiko watched over a village being transformed. A maze of bamboo scaffold tied the old town in its fishing wharf, while a belt of stony factories belched smoke over container ships anchored further off the coast. Was in Shenzhen a fishing village? Yoshiko was crestfallen, her blue blouse jutting against the concrete landscape. Why come here? I left a long time ago, Lamb's voice was pained, with both of his hands tucked deep into his nylon and jacket's pockets, back when I ran a business before the police. This is where I'm from, who I am without the badge, and I thought you should know that. As the day fades in Guangdong, a million office workers, factory men, housewives, and executives work and play in the lengthening shadow of Sony and Hong Kong. Their lives, always fleeting, but never so vivid, glitter along the banks of the Pearl River, a million lights momentarily holding back the unstoppable march of time. Tomorrow it could all be gone, though. And thus ends the story of the gadgeteer of Guangdong and Chung Guangdong Superman for now. Thank you so much for playing Guangdong. We really hope you enjoy playing as much as we did making it. And Guangdong is a washing color in life. But all Li Keqing sees are darkness and shadows, harboring murders in the twilight spaces untouched by Sony and Chung Kong. A lifetime ago. Uh, he claimed he would work for the prosperity of all Chinese willing to do and better themselves. Probably he would have admitted that he would do anything for a taste of the prosperity that the Japanese enjoyed. A luxury gained from his partnership with Mori Takeo. But now, surrounded by the empty space where his wife should have been, he finds that his prosperity is bereft of pleasure meaning. Neither can Lee bring himself to renew his promise to the people, not after his luck cost him so much, he has lost. Even as the threat of renewed hostilities between China and Japan looms over the horizon. It is 1972, and Li Keqing returns to work, in the forlorn hope that it can fill the gaping maw in his soul. God, that's just so dark. Oh, but Jesus Christ. 
But hey, we're pretty much done with this campaign. Uh, we're gonna do do one last thing though, and read about our last product. <clears throat> because once in Guangdong, always in Guangdong, we're gonna sell this uh, video or this tape recorder to the Japanese. Because Jesus Christ, do we need money? And it takes us two more days, so why not? <coughs> the VO 1700 color video recorder. A recording audio on a magnetic tape has been widespread for a long time, and the last several years has been miniaturized, with cassettes replacing large tape reels. It was only a matter of time before someone found a way to do the same with the video, just as television followed on the heels of radio. Sony steps up to the challenge with the new VO1700, which records video data from a television with space to record hours of programming and color no less. Using the new U-Matic video cassette format, this promises to allow viewers to record, pause, and rewind their favorite shows as they see fit. There's always a renewed surge of concern from film and television studios about the epidemic of video piracy this new technology will usher in, but the public response is so enthusiastic, most pay them no mind. And several studios have decided that if people are so excited prior to the programs, they might even pay for an official copy of their own. Finally, they don't have to worry about missing the big game. Look at that. Sony can revel in its delight. So that would put us with what? 80% growth. Still, honestly, a really bad deficit. 2.54 billion, that's actually still really bad. I'm kind of surprised it's still so bad with uh, the product cycle, but on the aisles. Misui Sumitomo Mitsubishi. Names of conjured up old images and read his mind. Ibuka, Tokyo Telecommunications, the horrors that came afterwards, the fear of the merciless bailiffs. The many nights he spent eating plain white rice on the floor of a dilapidated apartment in Hong Kong. He remembered selling his washed toothless peddler in an alleyway behind a restaurant for about half of what it was worth. Yes, he and the Zaibatsus had met before. Now, with these men sitting before him, it all came flooding back. Neither Subitomo nor Mitsui had bothered to show up, but Mitsubishi had sent some non entity, until Shiba had said to an audience for this farce. Marita had a fight to keep his lip from curling. That bald man, the one with the ridiculous purple tie, Marita recognized him from long ago. One of his book's lackeys, maybe. Whoever he was, he was currently flashing Marita's smile acidic enough to cut through steel girders. So, good to see you again, Marita, the bald man said, his rectus grin widening. How is President Lee? The other representatives tried and failed to saffle their giggles. Marita ignored that bay. Once his meeting was over, the representatives would head back to the cars, and the chauffeurs would drive them out of the building's garage. Garage? Garage. As he turned to the corner, they would spot a billboard advertising a T8 1120. It has been put out this morning, dozens of more would join it. <clears throat> Over the coming weeks in major metropolitan areas, all coincidentally placed quite near local Zaibatsu headquarters. And that was something Morita would pay good money to see. Hey, better healthcare quality as well. Look at that. Hey, we're down, we're underneath 40% poverty rate. And we have advanced healthcare, which helps increase monthly poverty decrease. And we get a lot of benefits from that too. Look at that. That's fantastic. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I was hoping there'd be an event for the Japanese thing, but hey, uh, make sure it's looking pretty thick. When did they get all this? Huh. Partisans in the East, yeah, that makes sense. The Quantum Army, Vices of Modernity, Chain to the Sun. How's, this, how's Japan doing? Italy in the sphere. Oh, yeah, we got Italy? Oh, I guess we did. Masano Suke. Wow. Yeah, that's actually pretty good. Half-hearted liberalization. It's not bad. Maximizing growth. Legacy of Ren Tokun, Showa 35. Huh. Russian Federative Republic. But Boris Yeltsin, of all people, Boris Yeltsin is here, huh? Wow. Who's in here? Is it still Borman? National Daddyism? Michael Foot? Democratic Socialism? Socialist Romance? Yeah. They have LBJ still in here in America, too. Great society. Vote franchise policy monthly. Desert Warriors, huh? Wow. Now who's leading Italy for them to join us? Democratic. We have a democratic socialist Italy with corporatist Japan. Wow. Well, let's take a look at the factions, too. Oh my god. So we have Organization Free Nations. Which isn't that huge. I mean, they do have... They're down here. And they also have the UK. Which is... Or Great Britain, I should say, really. They have the French community down here. Free France. Um, they have the Einheits pack. is looking pretty thick. All the way... Down, oh, they got even got Iran in there. Oh, Iraq. Oh, they have... We got Iraq in here? Oh, look at that. The United Arab States, of course. Then we have... Uh, Le Levantine Union. Pa can I say pal word Palestine? It's, it's late in the game, so it's fine, right? We have Israel and Palestine together. Wait, hold on. So Palestine has, owns most of this. 
Jerusalem is its own state. They're actually all together. Wow, the, the, this is weird. Wow. We have Iraq. We have got Oman and Yemen and Egypt. Oh my god, yeah, this is insane. Why would we not have enough oil with having all these Middle Eastern countries in with us? Of course, the OFN's down here too. We own all of East Asia. I mean, all literally all of East Asia except for the Viet Minh. We're just kind of like, don't kill us. Wow, that is absolutely insane. Maybe there's no event for uh, the Japanese uh, the supplement testing our spheres. So, or oh, Cuba's no event too. Look at that. Go figure. But hey, if you enjoyed the campaign, please consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below. As this campaign was a ton of fun, I hope you enjoyed it as well. Hope you have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you in another campaign.